Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss a disease, or I should say an infection, which is found throughout the world. It infects both males and females, young adults, uh, because they're engaged in sexual activity. This is a disease that's transmitted by sexual activity. It's called Trichomonas vaginalis. We owe knowing about this to a single individual who, way back in 1837, not only looked through a radically new microscope, namely the projection microscope, as you see projected here for your viewing pleasure. Uh, He shows a picture of a mite as, as what you might be, might, no pun intended, what you can see magnified greatly through a series of lenses. This was the golden age of microscopy as it was first emerging. And here we have Donnet, a Frenchman, uh, and he is largely credited with having described the ideological agent for Trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, it was also the golden age for developing histopathology staining, uh, and that's due to the, the Russian um, uh, Mechnikov and several other people in Russia developing these wonderful gram stains and uh, right stains and stains which we currently still use, as I might um, add. So, since this is a sexually transmitted infection, uh, we depict sex. And so, the infection begins by transferring... Um, the infection from a male to a female via sexual intercourse. The organism is introduced in the semen. The organism exists as a flagellated trophozoite. And in fact, if we use the word trophozoite here, you might expect us to also use the word cyst because trophozoites usually turn into cysts. We've begun this presentation with Giardia lamblia, one of those typical flagellated organisms that as both a cyst and a, and a trophozoite stage. In this case, we've never discovered a cyst stage for the, for the infection, so that there is only the trophozoite stage. Perhaps somewhere back in evolutionary history, there used to be a cyst, but it's been lost since the organism has now got, as its single mode of transmission, sexual contact. And I'll mention one other, which is much more rare. That is, by passage through the birth canal, during birth of a mother who's infected with Trichomonas vaginalis. The life cycle is very simple. It begins by acquisition of the infection. The organism then attaches to the endothelial, epithelial cells, excuse me, the epithelial cells, reproduces by binary fission, and starts to induce, or not, pathology. So who doesn't get sick from this and who does get sick from this? Usually women, the pathology in women is mostly uh, restricted to the, the vagina and the cervix. In males, the pathology is restricted to the prostate gland, if there will be symptoms at all from this. But ordinarily, there aren't any symptoms that males experience. And that's the reason why this remains as a silent infection and why it's possible to transmit this infection in all good consciousness without um, any ethical considerations because I think if you knew you had a disease or an, an organism which could cause disease in someone else that you yourself had, you would endeavor to, to get cured from that disease before you engaged in unprotected sex. In fact, this is a good reason for recommending protected sex in this case. And there are other good reasons too, by the way, for, of course. So the organism then re reproduces and multiplies on the surface of the epithelium and induces uh, irritations due to the, the secretions of the organism itself. This organism can also contain a double-stranded RNA virus called Trichomonas vaginalis RNA virus. And the organism at that point can induce a more uh, robust inflammation and uh, in doing so um, causes a, a more serious form of pathology. The, or, the um, female vaginal tract um, develops certain signs and symptoms as depicted here in this schematic drawing. Uh, normal vaginal uh, surface here, abnormal here, gets sloughing of cells. And the organism, because it's a facultative anaerobe, 
or I should say an aerotolerant anaerobe, it's an aerotolerant anaerobe, secretes as part of its metabolism molecular hydrogen, which the formation of which uh, we've been aware of for some time, but the actual biochemical reason for it still eludes us as to uh, knowing why this is one of a very few organisms that actually secretes molecular hydrogen. Craig Ventner, are you listening? This is a, a scanning electron micrograph of Trichomonas vaginalis just to show you its morphology and its uh, it's kind of a loose morphology actually. It's a it's it's a um, organism which if you observe it under the microscope it sort of changes its shape. It isn't rigid like many other organisms and so you could miss this if it weren't moving for instance if you just had a vaginal smear let's say or a pap smear that you've stained. Uh, trained technicians, of course, can recognize these organisms, and that's usually how they're diagnosed. And as I mentioned, the, paras the parasite secretes molecular hydrogen. It does hydrogen itself does not induce any uh, pathology on its own. It also, of course, secretes lots of things, including proteases, which results in host cell death. The virus increases the intense inflammation, which may, of course, allow more cells to be recruited to the area, and this may be to the advantage of the parasite. We don't know for sure. Infected males are, as I mentioned before, asymptomatic and serve as the source of the infection. And here we have a picture of electron micrograph of the organism depicted here, a portion of it. <clears throat> But over here, we have a picture of the hydrogenosomes, which in and of themselves are quite an interesting uh, structure that contain not only the enzymes necessary for producing molecular hydrogen, but also most of the other uh, enzymes with regards to its uh, anaerobic metabolism. So if you want to do research on trichomonas, you have to work in an anaerobic environment, making it uh, somewhat more difficult than uh, typical cell culture uh, studies. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. And now for a clinical vignette. This is a 22-year-old woman who comes in to be seen in the clinic in the Bronx with a report of a week of vaginal discharge and itching. She reports she's sexually active with her boyfriend. She reports that dis the discharge looks, looks bad and is yellowish. She's quite upset by this. She does also report some discomfort when she urinates. There's no strong odor reported. She otherwise feels well and reports her boyfriend is, is not saying that he has any symptoms. On vaginal exam, the vaginal discharge is thick. It's slightly yellow, like light green. There's no strong odor. There's some redness noted, uh, no tenderness or other abnormalities. Well, what about clinical disease? Approximately 20%, so one in five women infected will be asymptomatic, and I think that's critical. Um, Common clinical symptoms include mild vaginal discomfort with dyspareunia. That's um, discomfort when one has sex. Um, vaginal itching, burning on urination associated with this thick yellow blood tense discharge and rarely um, it can be incapacitating. It usually is not to that degree. Um, infection typically raises the vaginal pH from 4.5 to greater than five. Now that is a, a subtle change. So you actually need to use narrow um, pH spectrum paper. This is not your normal uh, spectrum paper that you're using. Uh, maybe you remember from high school that went from zero to 10. These are usually going from like four to six. On physical exam, women may present with uh, what is described as colpitis macularis or a strawberry cervix. Uh, they can also have vaginal and vulvar erythema. Uh, symptomatic disease in males, males can have symptomatic disease as well, can involve the urethra as well as the prostate. When the prostate becomes infected, pain in the groin and dysuria may be reported. And as I'll go on to mention, you can have asymptomatic disease in males as well, let's say 20 to 30 percent, so a large chunk as well. Infants born of mothers harboring the infection can offer acquire infection upon passing through the birth canal. And the clinical consequences of infection in newborns include um, infection of the urinary tract. Um, this is females in general. Um, but you also can rarely involve the lungs and end up with a pneumonia-like syndrome. These are some uh, graphic pictures of um, inflamed um, areas. And you can see here the sort of frothy hydrogen 
um, production, which I am certain Dixon has talked to you extensively about. Uh, Dr. De Pamier finds, I think, quite fascinating that there are um, organisms that they have the ability to produce molecular um, hydrogen. Now, what about diagnosis? As I mentioned, a big challenge is a large number of people infected are asymptomatic. And some people say, I say before, not just 20%, some people say the majority, 85% of infected females and 77% of infected males that are diagnosed on screening have no symptoms. Now, due to the high prevalence of asymptomatic infection, the only reason we're gonna, we're gonna catch all these people is by screening them. Otherwise, we're gonna miss a lot of these infections. Now, when we do have someone coming in with infection, uh, there's, I will say, five main ways that we approach this. One is microscopic observation. This is becoming increasingly challenging with changes in how healthcare is delivered in this country. But a simple wet mount looking under the microscope um, can be a reasonable approach. You can do cultures, looking for a positive culture. There are rapid antigen tests. There are nucleic acid and probe tests and there are nucleic acid amplification tests available. Now, if you're gonna do direct microscopy, um, you wanna do this actually right at the point of care because the organisms are only gonna remain modal for about 10 minutes. So if you delay, you really are gonna lose that sensitivity. The sensitivity is reasonable, say about 65% um, higher in heavy infection in experienced hands if you do it without delay. But as each minute goes by, uh, the sensitivity drops off. Uh, culture is more sensitive, um, but it takes time and isn't available in a lot of places. Uh, rapid antigen testing is really nice because um, it offers, offers a point of care option so that you can immediately make the diagnosis and treat. Uh, the nucleic acid amplification testing and the probes um, are highly sensitive. I will say the diagnosis by NAT or nucleic acid amplification testing is by far the most sensitive. And it's actually now the preferred method in most hospital parasitology diagnostic uh, laboratories. Here you can see a microscopic examination of the cervical exudate. Uh, this is a uh, phase microscopy image. And uh, as mentioned, there's a few other approaches. Uh, we've got not only the microscopy, but we have culture, we have rapid antigen testing, we have the probe, and we have uh, nucleic acid application here. Now, what about treatment? Um, I guess I'm going to have to give that warning again. Um, if you're going to take metronidazole or tinidazole, there is a potential issue and you want to restrain yourself from uh, alcohol intake for a little while because there can be this disulfuram reaction where you get sort of a taste of formaldehyde. But should you have the ability to abstain from alcohol, uh, you can do a single two gram one-time dose of metronidazole or tinidazole. And that's actually um, quite widely recommended because you can do it right there at the time and uh, make sure that they're treated. You can also do uh, metronidazole 500 milligrams twice a day for a week. Uh, reinfection is likely if the partner is there and not being treated. So um, the introduction of expedited partner therapy or EPT, and this is where you go ahead and immediately treat the partner who most likely is gonna be infected. Um, recurrence, if they have recurrence, it's usually going to be a reinfection. These are unfortunately quite um, ubiquitous um, in certain um, social sexual contexts. And so um, it, it isn't always that they've gotten a um, drug resistant uh, strain, but sometimes they can. And if they do get a resistant strain, uh, the CDC can get involved, can help you, but will often use um, compounded promomycin cream. Um, as well as um, combining this with a high dose tinidazole. And here is metronidazole, uh, a wonderful uh, medication which actually kills anaerobes by disrupting DNA, inhibiting DNA synthesis. And it's um, close cousin, a little bit different in structure as you can see, um, but in the same class um, of pharmacological agents. Now what about our patient? Now, our patient did have a slight elevation in the vaginal pH, a wet mount of vaginal secretions was done and revealed um, multiple motel trichomonads. Uh, the GC um, chlamydial testings so were testing for other um, sexually transmitted infections. So gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, syphilis, the syphilis, these were all negative. 
she was given the one the one time two gram dose of metronidazole and her partner also received expedited partner therapy EPT prevention and control is absolutely simple practice safe sex the use of a condom will eliminate the ability for the male asymptomatic male to transfer this infection to his partner there is actually several um Good articles on the review of the virulence factors uh, with regards to trichomoniasis because of the presence of this double-stranded RNA virus. And in fact, uh, several of the microbe.tv slash TWIP episodes deal with uh, the virulence of trichomoniasis and one of them specifically with this double-stranded RNA virus. So the next time we uh, meet, we'll be discussing the malarias. Thank you all for listening.